Idlewild Arts respectfully acknowledges the Kawishba Kawiakna, also known as Kawia Band of Indians, and all nine sovereign bands of Kawia people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations and continue to steward this land for all future generations. Idlewild Arts Foundation is proud to present One World, One Idlewild, the series, in conversation with Pamela Jordan. The series brings together thought leaders, creatives, influencers, and changemakers, highlighting the work of citizen artists whose careers and lives have been shaped by the transformative power of art. Have the courage to lead. The best thing that ever happened to me was the Northridge earthquake. Artists throughout the world, we are the speakers of truth. We are the most authentic expression of the day of the times. Be determined to get the most you can from every opportunity. And where you don't see opportunities, ask for them. Great leaders recognize that the work requires urgent patience. You can learn about classroom management, you can learn about the new curriculum, you can learn about the new way to teach whatever it is. But at the end of the day, if those students feel that love, they're more likely to listen, they're more likely to trust, they're more likely to be vulnerable. And in that space, that's where you can change some kid's life. From Idlewild Arts Foundation in Idlewild, California, I am Pamela Jordan with One World, One Idlewild, the series. I'm excited about this very special edition of our podcast because my guest today is renowned native food educator, Chef Freddy Bitsui. Chef Freddy is the former executive chef at the Mitsutam Cafe at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. Chef Freddy, as he is affectionately known here at Idlewild Arts, is one of a few native chefs at the forefront of preparing, presenting, and educating about foods indigenous to the Americas. I spoke with Freddie on November 13th, 2021, just ahead of the release of his cookbook, New Native Kitchen, celebrating modern recipes of the American Indian. We were also joined for this podcast by guest host, Shalia Ben. Shalia is the director of the Native American Arts Center here at Idlewild Arts. She is a lecturer, educator, and promoter of American Indian arts and culture, and originally hails from the Navajo Nation. She was born in Shiprock, New Mexico, where her family still practices traditional farming methods in the San Juan River Valley. We welcome guests to join us via Zoom, so occasionally you may hear a question or comment from our audience. Enjoy. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Pam, for that beautiful introduction. Again, my name is Shalia Ben. I am the new director of the Native American Arts Program, and it's my honor to be with you this evening. Uh, this evening, I'm going to introduce Freddie Bitsui to you. Freddie has been a longtime summer uh, Native American arts faculty at, Art, at Idlewild Arts. He is probably the one person that everybody gets to engage with while they're here during the summertime. The Native American Arts Festival Week takes place every single year as a programmatic uh, supplement to what's taking place here on campus, which is in a wide array of adult and Native American art workshops. During that time and during the festival week, Freddie will be here giving tastings during our Michael Cabote lecture series. He will kick off our uh, culmination, our culminating event and our opening event with wonderful food for us to, to eat. More importantly, the work that Freddie does is a part of this, you know, this survivance, this beautiful survivance of American Indian cultures. And it's really fitting that we're here with you all this evening in November uh, during Native American Recognition Month to recognize his contributions, but also as a celebration for a new book that is going to be released just next, next week. I have it right here called New Native uh, new Native American, new Native kitchen. And without further, further ado, I will turn it over to Freddie and we'll just kind of have a really casual uh, conversation back and forth in the kitchen along with Pam. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, uh, both Pam and Chea. Uh, this has always been fun. I've been working with Idlewild for over 12 years. I'd say about 14. It, you know, it, it seems, seems like it seems more like four, but I, I've been coming back every summer and I just absolutely love it. I enjoy it. And um, I know that I'm Pam's probably favorite. Um, 
Otherwise, I wouldn't be <laughs> cooking in here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, what I do is I talk about native cuisine as, as, as far as things kind of progress. And native food has been kind of forming um, its own identity. And we're kind of, it's, it, during its fruition period back in the uh, late uh, 20, um, early 2010s around there, people started saying, let's do French food with native cuisine. And people started saying, let's do only native cuisine and non European techniques, non-European ingredients. So it's been kind of molding itself into its own type of what we call in the uh, cuisine world as, as a mother cuisine. Uh, mother cuisines would be known as French cuisine, Italian cuisine, uh, Asian cuisine, and Indian cuisine. But there's really nothing as, um, as of that South Asian um, Indian cuisine. Um, as far as uh, any, anything else, there's uh, Native American cuisine. It's, it's such a vast um, study that it pretty much covers the entire Western hem Hemisphere. So to put that all in one kind of cuisine, it's, it's a little bit difficult to do. So what I decided to do is really just kind of focus on how native cuisine has been presented and where it's going to be. And that's kind of what the book represents. And those are the kind of two recipes that we're going to be doing today uh, out, of the, um, uh, out of the book. And um, I, I think when you get a copy of the book, you'll see the recipes. Uh, we're going to do a, a Navajo lamb. Um, roasted Navajo lamb dish, and also a rice pudding dish. And I'll explain the stories to those particular dishes as we, as we go along. So um, why don't we get started, and I'll just start getting prepped, and we'll, I'll tell you kind of the basics on how to get these two things going when they can be done at the exact same time, okay? All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Freddie. <clears throat> so Freddie mentioned in his book in the opening that um, he got his beginning uh, watching his mother and his grandmother cook. And so um, I know that that's very similar to, you know, how I actually started learning to cook on my own. I am nowhere as good as Freddie is. But um, uh, Freddie, can you talk a little bit about um, the influence that um, our culture as Diné people have on the way that we interact with food? Yeah, first and foremost, that uh, cooking in, in, in the, when I was growing up in the Navajo world was not a man's job. Only women did the cooking. And so any interest in cooking, it was always, it was always a, a looked down upon. So I always had to go out and herd the sheep or help my um, uncles and father build uh, little ramadas outside. So when ceremonies were happening, we'd have you know, a hogan or ramada outside, and I'd be the one having to help when I'd really always just wanted to be cooking. But, um, but as I got older, um, the only thing that I could do was observe and watch. And it was, it was always pleasurable to see that because I always, there's always kind of like this inner warmth watching my mother and my grandmother cook. And it just, they always just seemed happy doing it. Even though when I got it at, as old as I am, nobody really is happy cooking unless you really enjoy doing it. Um, so what I'm starting right now is the onion sauce. And what you want to do with the onion sauce is you want to make sure that this is called the steeping method. Okay, So we have the onion, the juniper berry. And we're going to put that in. All we're going to do is we're just going to cover that with some stock. OK, let me, let me use this um, particular thing right here. And we're going to let that cover. And we're going to um, turn the pan on. It's a good thing I memorized which knob. OK, and we're just going to put a little salt in here. Now, just so you know that um, people tend to believe that native food doesn't contain salt. But in the Southwest, salt, uh, the Apache tribes and Navajo tribes always had access to salt. You had the Bonneville Salt Flats. You have some salt mines in the, uh, the Apache area, area uh, parts of Arizona. So it's, it's, also, it's also been a very vital part of uh, Native traditions in the West. In the Plains, in the Southern Plains, totally different story. But if you had access to the oceans, you also had access to salt. Salt is not an ingredient you know, when it comes to cooking. It's, it's always a tool. Because what salt does is it starts to dehydrate and it extracts the sugars from the onion so or any type of vegetable. So you know when you put salt on top of um, any type of vegetable, water starts to appear on top? Well, that's what you're trying. You're, you're extracting the water so you can isolate the sugar. And that's what makes the uh, vegetables a lot sweeter. So that's what you're using the salt for. You're not using it to flavor, OK? That's what comes with meat. So when it says seasoned beef, that's when you, um, you use salt as far as seasoning. So you just want to get all of these ingredients going. And juniper berries, if, if you haven't seen them, um, what's really interesting here is I went to every single supermarket down in uh, Palm Desert looking for juniper berries. I couldn't find any. But lo and behold, a 
the fairway up here in Idlewild, it has juniper berries. <laughs> and I thought that was just pretty cool. So, so we're going to let this, um, what I ref uh, refer to as the steeping method. Now, can you look at the recipe? It's like 133. Are those all the recipe <laughs> ingredients that I need on this particular? Page 133? 193. 193. This is a very, very impressive book. 193. You know, I, I heard, I hope I'm not making this up. I heard that the, the photographer who did the photographs for you in this was the same as uh, Chef Ina Garden. Is, um, is that somewhat right? It's actually very correct, yes. Uh. Ah! Yeah. So Ina Gardens, photo um, the photographer who did the uh, photos for her book, did my book. And uh, so I'm one degree away from her. So <laughs> just give me a few more years and I'll probably be as temperamental and um, <laughs> demanding as her recipes s s show. OK, so yeah, that's, uh, no, no, this, it flipped for some reason. I'm sorry, I didn't make a note card for these. I love it that you're referring back to the, to the cookbook. Yeah, it, it's. I love cookbooks. When I was a, a young girl, my mother used to read cookbooks like novels, and I, I have grown up doing that. I don't know if you can see them back here, but I have a, a lot of cookbooks. I just love them. Yeah. That, that was one of the first things I've noticed when I came over. I was like, whoa, there's a lot of cookbooks there. <laughs> no, cookbooks are a great, great resource for everyone to have because they're, they're, you really don't have to follow them word for word and, and direction by direction. You always throw a little bit of your personality into it as well. And that, that's kind of like the whole purpose of having a, a, a kind of like a new recipe for you to learn. And it's, it's always, a, a, the best thing a part about a cookbook is it, it allowed me to give some little stories. So with each recipe, there's kind of like a little story that kind of goes along with, with the recipe. And um, I think it's always, always nice to know where the, um, the influence from the uh, foods comes from. Because if anyone really understands Native American history, uh, we all like to say that it's an oral tradition, so nothing was written down. So there's really not a whole lot of classical na Native American recipes that have been written down. Mm -hmm. So any kind of Native American recipe that you see from um, any chef or anything, they're all new recipes that kind of that gather things. Like this particular dish, my mom uh, would tell me stories about my grandfather and how he used to put sumac on lamb. When he lived, he, he, he worked up in the La Plata Mountains near Durango. And he used to um, herd cows for some rancher. So um, he used to put sumac on the lamb. And I kind of would scratch my head. And i say, I wonder how, you know. And the onion sauce as well. She goes, he just used to boil onions and to just let them, when they, you know, when you boil vegetables, they just kind of start to disintegrate. And that's what he used to do. So he just used to pour it on the lamb like that. So, I, I, so this is kind of like the influence of where the dishes came from. I think one thing that's really interesting about um, native cuisine is that it's ever evolving. And uh, a lot of people don't realize, but sheep weren't originally here in this part of the world. Um, it wasn't until about 1540 when the Spanish arrived in the southwestern parts of what is today the United States where they brought sheep. Um, Navajo people, we love sheep and we started herding lots of them. So that's, uh, that's when that then became a staple in our traditional diet. But before then, <coughs> we cooked, you know, Corn, beans, squash, you know, all different things like that. Lots of orchards of different fruits. Uh, apricots are our favorite back home. Uh, wild asparagus, you name it. So, um, and you know, uh, where we would get our protein was from uh, deer and elk and rabbit. Which is all really good, by the way. Oh yeah. And traditionally, traditionally speaking, um, as a part of our creation story, we're not <laughs> supposed to eat um, animals that fly or swim. Yeah, so if you're like super uber traditional Navajo, then you don't do that. I joke around and say I'm a quarter white, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, my, my grandmother was, was white, and so I was like, oh, so it's okay for me to eat the sushi. And so um, I get my out that way. You know, what's really interesting the thing about that is I remember a long time ago when I was a kid, and I was in the, uh, the Safeway with my grandmother, and I asked her, why, why can we don't, do not eat the nopalis, the cactus pad. And all she said to us, that's not our food. Right. So I grew up the longest time thinking and believing that um, we couldn't eat that. But it was just kind of the story saying that, OK, you have to acknowledge the other fact that other people eat food too. So we just can't hoard everything for ourselves. So that's kind of like what I learned from it. And so that's why when we talk about native food to one another, it's always important to understand that we have to acknowledge the other cultures that live around us 
and respect the fact that we all have to eat and share our foods together. So it's just, it's just kind of one of those uh, factoring things that I always teach with my, um, in my classes. So, um, so what we're doing here, let me get back to the cooking real quick, is we're getting all our sauces ready. So you, as you can see, I got the onion sauce ready. Now we're gonna do the cranberry sauce. And it's just ca your basic kind of tip, um, typical kind of cranberry sauce where you get the fresh frozen, cr um, excuse me, the frozen cranberries. And you also um, will add some orange juice and some agave, okay? So I got this agave. There's only two places that I get my agave from. Is one at the local <laughs> Safeway because they have this organics brand. And then at the Costco. And as you can tell, I'm getting a lot older because I pu start putting the in front of everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, those are the only two that um, do not have any uh, high fructose, syru um, fructose corn syrup in there because lately a lot of companies have been getting agave and then diluting them with the high fructose corn syrup. So make sure you're really, really careful about that. And this is just a really easy recipe where you get uh, two cups of cranberries. And it's okay to get, if you're gonna cook berries, always get the frozen berries, don't get the fresh because the fresh is more expensive and it's better fresh to eat fresh. So if you're gonna get it frozen, it costs less and you're gonna pulverize it anyway. So, you know, save a little bit of money on that. Yeah, so you're gonna put in your two, cranberry, um, two cups of cranberry in here and some orange juice. And if you notice one thing is None of the, there's very few recipes in the book that don't have any flour or butter in them. It's not that I don't like flour or butter or olive oil, but when you change the flavors using flour, butter, and olive oil, it doesn't necessarily make it Native American cuisine. So you just, um, just keep an eye on that when you uh, uh, buy your ingredients. That's a great point. Are there any questions from the audience? You know, I, I wanted to, I heard Freddie say it, and I wanted to ask you, Shalia, I noticed kind of lately, it might have been happening, but I'm just noticing it, um, seeing Dene after um, some names. You know, I can't tell when it's there or when it's not there. But can you tell, can you talk about that for a minute? Because I heard, I heard Chef Freddie also say that. Oh, well, yeah, that's our tribal affiliation. So um, <clears throat> oftentimes in, in periodicals or things that are written up, if you're working with or dealing with a native person, um, we as much as possible like to, you know, say who and what we are. Um, so you might know the word Navajo. Navajo was a word in Castilian Spanish which was used to um, identify who we were as Diné people. And the word Diné simply means the people. So it's really, people. yeah. And you'll find that many tribes in the um, United States have their own traditional names for them. Um, and, you know, Apache is another example. Mm -hmm. um, they're a, a kind of like a distant but also close relative of us, Diné people. Um, and they don't call themselves Apache. They call themselves Inde. And so, Inde. right. And so you have all of these different tribes that have these traditional names, and so that's where Diné comes from. Oh. We're, all, we're also full of ourselves because we always call ourselves the people. <laughs> and it's quite general throughout the, the globe. Um, <laughs> so what's uh, kind of like anthropologists, because I, I study in anthropology and we always like to name at things after ourselves. Um, so the next recipe is called the um, rice pudding. And as you can see, we got the cranberry sauce ready for the uh, rice pudding. Rice pudding is clearly not indigenous because it, um, c you know, the majority of the rice came from the eastern part of um, the globe. The reason why we use rice pudding is when, um, when the um, Iberians arrived in Mexico, oh, there's a ghost in here, by the way. <laughs> when the Iberians arrived in Mexico, they decided to continue um, west, and they arrived in Asia, and that's where they brought the rice back. So rice is a huge part of native cuisine in Mexico, and it moved up north, so it kind of became a staple in homes, and rice pudding was one of the most popular ones, and this is where the recipe comes from. Just because the ingredients aren't indigenous to this part of the world, it doesn't necessarily make it non-native. Uh, there's a little, you know, a lot of semantics that deal with it. However, but when you look at ratatouille, it has squash. That doesn't necessarily make that a native dish, it makes it a French dish. So when it comes to cooking technique and how the ingredients are used, that's how we kind of classify and we um, categorize these foods in these um, certain types of way. But all I can say is, if your grandmother made it, most likely it comes from that culture. 
So we're gonna I put the rice in and we have the flame going and we're gonna put the milk in, okay? So we're just gonna cover it and have it on a low heat, um, a medium high heat, not boil because when it boils, it's just gonna start overflowing and it's not gonna make your, uh, your range look pretty. Let me put this back in the fridge. So, okay, so well, let's get this cooking. All of my friends always wonder, how can you have all six burners on and you don't seem to be nervous? When really deep down inside, there's a lot of nerves. Okay, so now we have the, um, the rice pudding going. Everything's going. We have the cranberry sauce. We have the rice going. So is anybody cooking along with me? Have you caught up? Any questions right now about certain things? Uh, yeah, Christy Hubbard, her husband John, is cooking. Christy, you want to unmute? Tell us how John is doing. John, talk about how you're doing. All right, great. Let's <laughs> <laughs> just talk to this guy. Oh. Hello. Yeah, I've been brown. I've been browning the lamb. It looks beautiful after browning. So I'm almost ready to put it in the oven. Oh yes, yeah, very nice. Because I'm 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 going to start the lamb right now on this side. Is anybody else cooking? Yeah, we're doing the rice, and we just done. We just finished the rice, and we're about to add the agave and the salt and the vanilla. Excellent. Which I should start adding as well on this side. Okay, so the salt again. Salt is a natural flavor enhancer. It's it again. I'll always repeat. It's not an ingredient. You ever heard of MSG? MSG is like a synthetic version of salt. Well, what salt does is it kind of activates all the molecules in the food and it just enhances the flavor. Now, if you start tasting salt, that means you put too much in, so you gotta cut it down a little. And so that's really what it comes down to. It's not, it's not you're not meant to taste salt while you, um, while you eat or cook. Just keep that in mind. So I'm gonna put the agave in. You just remembered, remind me to do that, so. And agave is a natural um, sweetener. There's two different types. There's the, uh, the blue agave, which makes tequila. And then there's the uh, standard one that you'll find in the Sonoran Desert. And I was part of an agave roast, and it was really interesting that they, um, you know, they dig all these huge pits, and they put like about six roots, because the agave root is like about, you know, that huge. And they put them in the ground, and they roast them for about four or five days. And the whole purpose of it was when you were either hunting or when you were um, foraging for food or when you were just traveling, you'd have little sticks of the um, agave and you'd just uh, suck on it to where you can get your nutrition and then keep going. But agave is really good for blood sugar as well, by the way. So just, just also. That's, that's amazing you bring that up. One of the first things that I got to do when I first started here at Ida Weld Arts was I took a, an agave harvesting class with the Malky Museum. And the Native Arts uh, faculty, then uh, the Daniel McCarthy, who has just recently, unfortunately, passed away, he was teaching this class. And he's the one that taught me how from palm to pine, how what you're passing by on the road, 74, making your way up to Idlewild, it's just a huge grocery store. Um, so my appreciation for like the land that we live on and how much abundance of like nutrition is out there is amazing. And we did, we, we, we pulled that root out, we threw it in a pit, we fired it all night and then took it out the next morning and it was very sweet. Um, and different parts of the bulb of the, of the plant um, have, has different texture and different taste. Um, and it was just really remarkable to be able to try that out. So um, I, I really like the story about agave. I'm a huge fan of it now. It, it's it's a great 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 um, ingredient for us. I don't want to say sugar substitute, but if you want to sweeten your coffee or tea, it's 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 better to use that than than sugar. Trust me. Okay, so what I'm doing with the lamb here is, is I used to work for a French chef, and this is one beautiful thing that I I admire him teaching me this is because growing up. Um, when we would have family butcher sessions, we'd just have these huge legs of lamb and we would just roast them and it would take forever to cook. However, if you learn how to, what we uh, refer to as muscle out the meat, or you can ask your butcher, if you still go to one of those romantic markets where the butcher actually works, um, to ask them to muscle out the meat. 
And anywhere you see these, um, where the fat is, that's kind of like an isolated part of the muscle. So you just kind of cut through that. So just kind of cut through those particular guides and you get these little parts of, of lamb. So um, I don't usually tie them, but if you have some butcher's twine, you can tie them and, and um, sear them and roast them like that. But you get these, number one, what it does is it takes your roasting time down tremendously. So instead of having a piece of lamb in your oven for hours on end, this really can be in there for about 30 to 40 minutes, depending on the temperature that you like. And it really is convenient. So, so I, I, this is one of the European techniques that I incorporate into my, my, my cooking. So one thing really neat about <coughs> a, a Navajo way of eating lamb is that nearly no part of it goes to waste. <laughs> um, I can remember some of my earliest memories while we were butchering back home for maybe like a ceremony or uh, just a reunion, what, you know, you name it. Um, we take the, the intestines, the intestines of the sheep and you empty it out. And you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> Eat and you take those and it's very fatty. You get the fat from the, the sheep and you wrap the intestines around this fat. And then I used to call them ET fingers because they looked like ET fingers and you roast them and it's kind of, how do, how do you explain it? It's like pork rinds, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's, it's kind of like ch um, chitlins. Oh, and, okay. and s instead of stuffing them, the in um, intensives are actually wrapped around the fat. Right. So it's really good, it's such a delicacy and I actually haven't had it for like five, six yeah, years. It smells like chitlins. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> I can attest to that one. And my mom told me that she would fight with her brothers and sisters over the eyeballs and the brain. Um, you just take the head, wow. throw it in the frat fire, let it cook, and then have at it. So. Yeah, there, there's, there's a, the reason why the parents gave the kids the intestines to clean because they didn't want to do it. The right. kids thought it was a fun thing to do. <laughs> but it really, they just, you know, wanted the kids to. Um. So like I said, um, this, this dish comes from my, my stories my mom told me about my grandfather, who I've never met. I, I don't know anything about him. Um, he passed away when I was, you know, when she was 13, so clearly it was long before that, um, before I was born. But uh, he went up to the mountains, and these are kind of the way that my recipes were developed, was just kind of like the possibility of, hmm, I wonder how that tastes. So um, sumac is, uh, is, is a, a berry that grows in the uh, Four Corners region. There's also one that grows in um, the northern um, Midwest, which is poisonous. There's also another variety that grows in the, um, the Mediterranean. So if you can't find a Navajo variety of sumac, you can always revert to going to like an Iranian store, or a Middle Eastern store uh, to acquire the sumac. The flavors are a little, the flavors are very similar. It's just the one, that I feel that the one in, um, from the Four Corners is a, very acidic and it's very lemony to the point where we even make a, a lemonade or a, a sumac aid out of um, the berries. And it's a very sweet drink, so, or excuse me, very acidic. So when you add the sweetener, it tastes just like lemonade. So it goes great with fish and it goes great with lamb. Um, and that, those are the only two that I would recommend you to, to have it with. Um, unless you're Middle Eastern and you look, put sumac on everything. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna put some salt on here. Again, to season. Season very well with when you have um, bulks of meat because um, it just adds a lot of flavor. So just salt and pepper. And um, I'm gonna be a little shameless here but I have a spice line coming out and this is what my sumac spice is. So that's where this jar comes from. Freddie, I really appreciate what you have to say about salt um, and salt being so important. <clears throat> and I think as, an, as a person, a native person that utilizes salt in your cooking and even traditionally, um, it's not something that is meant to overpower your dish. Um, it's, it's a tool, as he mentioned. Um, salt is also something very sacred for us as Navajo people. Um, in fact, my fourth clan is Salt Clan. So in Navajo, you would say Ashihi. Ashihi is how you say salt in Navajo. And it's one of the four clans that I use to identify myself as a Navajo woman. 
I, I am water's edge, so that means I like to be by the water. So you can find Freddie at the beach a lot? All the time. Did, chef, did you uh, have much lamb on the menu when you were executive chef in, at Smithsonian? I did. I, I, I did. I, I tried to incorporate as much um, Navajo food as possible. Uh, you know, number one, to identify myself as Navajo. But um, the museum really focused on a lot of the Plains tribes. And, and you've been to the museum, uh, South American tribes. But there was really nothing from the Southwest. So uh, I had to, my, my job was to change that in. Uh, I, th I thought I did a pretty good job at it, so. No, I know he did. <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, Navajo people that are working, you know, in, in tribal governance in, in Washington, D.C. And you can't, you, can't, you can't get Navajo food anywhere else. And so I heard from a couple of friends of mine, you know, be, to be able to go over to the museum and get yourself some lamb or something that tastes like home was something that was just remarkable and really meant a lot to many people. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, my mom hates it when I do this at home, but make sure your pan is really hot. And it'll, you'll have some oil things splashing all over the place, but don't be afraid of it. Um, usually when you see cooks on TV, they have a lot of burn marks on them, and you know, it's, it's no big deal. But uh, just proceed with caution. But you want your, um, I forget who it was, but you said the um, caramelization on your lamb looked really nice, right? So. This is what we're, what we're gonna do. But also don't um, crowd your pan because uh, I was just explaining to Chris here that the reason why pans are designed is the wider, the um, more shallow, it's meant to be dry. You're not supposed to hold any moisture in there. The slender, the taller the pot, you're gonna want, you know, it's gonna take a lot um, more time for the moisture to evaporate. So you, if you crowd it, you're going to start boiling your lamb, and you don't want to do that. It's just not going to give it a really nice texture. So we're going to go ahead and um, go ahead and let this sear. And when you roast, you're going to want a, a, a pan with a rack because you're going to want air circulating around from the bottom. It's okay if you don't have one, but this really does help out a lot. Are there any questions we have out there so far? We, I have one here. It's uh, somebody's getting ready to eat. What is a popular beverage to enjoy with this dinner? Vino. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> I, 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 per, I personally like Malbec with, uh, with my lamb. Ah. Um, so that's, that's always a, a good um, right, thing, no, beverage, yeah. I add or water, because I don't drink any sugary beverages. Uh, just water or wine, that's about it. <laughs> and don't tell me that wine has sugar in it because it doesn't. <laughs> any more questions out there? Yeah, any more on there, Palencia? Yes, I wanted to know, you talked about this shallow, um, you this talked about a shallow pan. So you said the deeper the pan is, the drier it will get, so you need the shallow pan. Opposite. Backwards. Opposite. Yeah, the other way. The, the other way around. So if it's deeper, it will scatter in the moisture. Okay. Yeah, it, it'll, talk, it'll take a lot more time for it to evaporate. But if you're in a, sa a saute pan like this, you're just going to, the moisture is just coming out. You know, it's just quite, it steams a lot more. That's interesting. Yeah, there you go. Okay, see, look at that color right there? Wow. Okay, so you don't necessarily need to sear the bottom part. That's, um, in my opinion, I don't think you do. But um, a lot of people like to sear the bottom part. Because it's all about presentation and nobody really sees the bottom anyway. And so what made you want to go this route. Uh, you know, on the podcast, I'm always asking people really what's behind their passion, right? What's that earliest member, memory that made you want to be a chef or, you know, pursue this? I, I actually never really desired to be a chef. I've always cooked. So um, one day I got home when I was in college and um, it's kind of one of those days where you just kind of, what the H-E double hockey stick am I going to do? So I turned on the light in my uh, apartment and I, you know, had a stand mixer, I had a food processor, and my pots were hanging from the ceiling, and there was nothing in my living room. 
I was kind of thinking, okay, so any other senior in college would probably have like a PS5 and you know anything else, and the you know empty pizza boxes in the in the fridge. But um, fundamentally, it really was about my anthropology. I mean, I, I make a whole lot of I make a whole lot of jokes about it. But when I studied anthropology, I focused a lot on ancient Puebloan food ways. So the people of Chaco Canyon and how they uh, preserved food, um, how they uh, shipped food, because the Puebloans lived all the way up to uh, Cortez, even to where my grandmother lived in Hovenweep, and down into Chaco Canyon. So they had a vast system of uh, transporting food. And that's what I was interested in. I really wanted to study it more than cook it. But um, when I got to um, an archaeology class, the instructor and I started talking about what it is that I was focusing on. So he said, why don't you study um, modern day food techniques and see if they had a food culture back in prehistoric times? Because when we look at native culture and historic native food, we always tend to, peop we always tend to think people just walk up to the, the berry tree and just you know <laughs> ate off the tree and then walked away, right? Or hunted, killed a deer and roasted on a spit where they killed it. But it really didn't. It really wasn't like that. There was actually drying a food system. There was trading. There were so many things involved. So that's kind of what I wanted to do to see if there were celebrity ancient prehistoric Native American cooks. You're listening to One World One Idlewild, the series presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. My name is Pamela Jordan. We'll be right back. Idlewild Arts Academy is an independent boarding arts high school whose mission is to change lives through the transformative power of art. Located just two hours inland from Los Angeles and San Diego and one hour from Palm Springs, the school sits on 205 acres of forested land in the San Jacinto Mountains. Academy students receive a challenging college preparatory academic curriculum while engaging in pre-professional training in their chosen arts discipline. The school is also home to its world-renowned summer program that serves children starting at age five through adults age 95. Idlewild Arts believes that art is the greatest teacher of humanity and that the practice of creativity, no matter the ultimate expression, hones each individual's desire and ability to craft global change. To learn more, visit idlewildarts.org. To receive a $50 discount to the 2023 Kids and Teens Summer Programs, use code OneWorld2023. That's O-N-E-W-O-R-L-D 2023. Quantities are limited. Restrictions apply. This is One World, One Idlewild, the series, presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. My name is Pamela Jordan. If you're just joining us, my guests today are Chef Freddie Batsui, author of New Native Kitchen, Celebrating Modern Recipes of the American Indian. He is joined by Shalia Ben, Director of the Native American Arts Center here at Idlewild Arts. beginning of the pandemic, we were really looking forward to summer 2020 here at Ida Wild Arts. You know, we were looking forward to having Chef Freddie here, <clears throat> 17 different workshops in Native Arts. And so Freddie and I, we got on the phone and by then he had already left, uh, you know, DC. He was back home uh, in, in Gallup, New Mexico, right adjacent to the Navajo Nation. And we got to talking and said, hey, let's create some online cooking courses. And so we started from scratch. We started ordering things and equipment from Amazon, shipping it to, to Gallup, New Mexico. And we got to actually cook inside of Chef Freddy's mother's kitchen. And so oh, no. um, that was really heartwarming. It was really good to see your mom, Freddie. Yeah. Um, we got really personal about things. Freddie's mom actually used to babysit my mother um, when she was a little, when, uh, when she was a little one. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of like, and our, we have family members in common too, so it was kind of like nice to be able to, to touch base and to see your mom. And then you know JW, yeah. your your little nephew, he we hired him on as a production assistant. So you had this nine-year-old running around on the camera um, in, in, in Chef Freddie's mom's kitchen, um, helping out with camera angles. You name it. It was really heartwarming and. 
again, I am amazed that we didn't get a fire alarm. None of this happened, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have two questions. So yeah. I saw you um, chop up the, yes. the zest instead of, you know. Yeah, well, usually uh, I, I travel a whole lot, and I lost like six pepper mills. Oh. My, sometimes I forget to check my bag, and my knives are in there. They take it away from me at security. So all these different stories. So um, one way that I do uh, lemon zest is I thinly just slice the... Um, the uh, yellow part off the, the lemon to where you don't have any of the uh, white pulp on there. This right there, so it's like that. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot of knife skill, but it just um, it just makes it a little, um, and just do little. I mean, again, this is something that I do for a living, so I probably make it look a lot easier. But um, it's just the way that I, I, I prefer to do it. But um, if you just get a cheese grater and just grate over it, you don't need a, a, a zester from Williams-Sonoma or anything. Or, unless you're that one who likes all the gadgets and everything. So, okay, so this is how the cranberry sauce should look, okay? Well, it's almost done. Um, it's gonna just get thickened a little bit because the agave works just like sugar, okay? And this is how the onion sauce looks, okay? Now again, remember, keep in mind, when the sauce is done, it doesn't have any type of starch or flour in there to make it really tight. So what's, what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna have to use the natural starches and sugar in, um, I keep thinking that one's on, um, to keep um, the natural sugars and the starches and the onion to kind of thicken it itself. So we're gonna put this in the blender back here. Okay. And it's gonna get a, bit, a little bit loud so you can talk amongst yourselves while this is happening. taking the, the pan juices after you brown the lamb and adding them to the onion sauce? Uh, that's perfectly fine if you want to do that. I do do that sometimes. Um, the reason why I keep them separate is because I have a very strong tendency, especially with the, my client clientele, we have a lot of vegetarians. So if I can keep, uh -huh. if I can keep yeah. things vegetarian, I keep those vegetarian. I, you know, so if they want to mix them together, that's fine. But I did used to do that. I did used to do that a lot, but now it just kind of, I always get the, can you make one that's vegetarian? So I just kind of have this mentality where if it doesn't need the meat product, don't use the meat product. So, or animal product, I should say. So yeah, you can go ahead and do that by all means. That's a really, it actually even tastes better. I do make one with bacon as well, like a bacon onion sauce that I do with trout, so. And you just, you, I forget the uh, spite, the herbs that you put in there, but uh, twigs and all, leaves and all, you just. Twigs and all, yeah. Um, as long as they're not like, um, like the thick rosemary. Uh -huh. If they're just kind of flimsy and everything, I, I say go with it and just go ahead and do it. Um, one thing that you can do as well, that's a little um, technique that I just, when I want to really impress people. Since juniper, um, gin is ferment, um, what's the right word for making hard liquor? Distilled. Since uh, uh, juniper is distilled to make uh, gin, what I tend to do to when I want to be fancy is I'll flambe some gin with the berries and it'll kind of enhance the juniper fla flavor in the sauce. So if, if, if you're daring to do that, by all means. I only do that in my own kitchen where it's my insurance. <laughs> so, okay, so everything's coming together here. We're gonna put this in the oven at 350, all right? So everything is about coming together here. I don't want to burn anybody, so I'm going to put this over here. Okay, so I made a few side dishes from the dish that um, we, we don't have enough time to demo, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and show you how, how they turned out. I like this is the squash and corn. Okay, so a little story to this particular dish is um, this is this, these are kind of like the, they're, they're, they're they're probably the largest problems that um, native culture has with talking about Native American cuisine. My first uh, menu at the museum, I wrote, and I wrote all the recipes. I was explaining to my, my, um, my staff that 
this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna make squash and corn. It was one of my favorite dishes growing up that my grandmother would always make. Because where she lived, uh, going to uh, Cortez from um, the mountains, Cortez, Colorado, there would be all of these zucchini farms and squash farms and watermelon farms. So on her way back, she'd always pick up, um, you know, zucchini and squash and corn and everything. So she'd saute them together. And it just has a natural, wonderful flavor. So when I introduced the recipe at the museum, there was a sweet cook. Her name um, was Garzon. And she's indigenous. She's from Mexico. And she was looking at me and she said, but you're cooking that wrong. I go, I'm not cooking this wrong. This is how my grandmother made it. And her response was, well, this is how I cook it at home. I go, so you're, you're not cooking right at home? And she goes, no, no, no. And her response was, the gringos don't like it like that. And you know, because in French cooking, uh, it's, it's required to have your vegetables to have an al dente, a bite to it. Whereas when, when it comes to cooking native food, there's kind of like this sauteing and steaming technique that's used at the same time. Um, and that's not particularly used with European cooking. So it, it, it took a lot of convincing for me to tell people it's okay. You know, if, if French chefs can tell me that I'm not cooking French food wrong, then I'm a Native American chef that can tell a French chef you're not cooking Native, na Native American food right. So that's kind of what it, um, the story that comes about this, this particular dish here. So um, it's, it's in the, I'm not, sh don't remember what page it is in the book, but it, it's in the book. And this is how the onion sauce looks. Okay, so if you're going to um, just go ahead and let it reduce, there's no problem with it. Because the more you let it reduce, and this is a French technique, the more you let it reduce, it, it, it tastes more perfect, if that makes any sense. Uh, because the golden rule in French cooking is you cook to perfection. And that's, that's one thing that comes with the sauce here. So there's nothing wrong with letting it reduce. Just don't let it burn. <laughs> now, Chef, you mentioned, um, you know, you're talking about the, the recipes in the book. When did you start writing the book? Was it like before the pandemic? You got bored during the pandemic or? About a year before the, uh, well actually I started working on the idea of the book, um, of what I wanted to say about 10 years ago. Because I wanted to, you know, that was when I was kind of little, full of myself and you know, you, you get out of art history and anthropology and we talk about ego, right? Um, so when I started studying the native aspect of food, I wanted, to kind of bring a more understanding about um, the French way of cooking. Again, like I said at the beginning, the mother, the mother um, cuisines of the world. And then I started to realize that most of the native chefs today, they're really talking about the past. Which there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. I, I think the awareness and the representation is great. But I think there's a lot of focus on what's happening in the past and what's happening in, in, you know, right now as, a, as opposed to where native food is going. And how it, and how it can evolve to become, you know, um, a new entity, and and working with these recipes and playing with things because, uh, as as you know, it's, it's an academic term. But when we talk about infusion and diffusion, when we come into a new part of the world, we bring something different. And so when we move to a new part of the world, the people that are there already say, "You're really wearing that. Good luck," you know, because I always. The one story I tell people is I was always ashamed of wearing shorts when I was younger. And I moved to Phoenix, and every day I would wear jeans, you know, especially in the 120 degree weather. And I just look at people and I was like, oh, they're wearing shorts. So one day I just went to the store, bought shorts, and I became infused into Phoenix's culture, you know. So that's kind of the way, that, the way it works. They take something, you know, you take something from one another. And that's one thing that will always happen to food. The food will always be a part of that process. So we can't claim you know, complete authority and saying, oh, this always has to contain uh, cactus as an ingredient, or it always has to contain this. Yes, to make it traditional and authentic, um, that's true. But to have a part of those techniques, like we can do the squash and corn with, um, um, Zucchini or? Well, no, um, what's the purple vegetable? Eggplant. Eggplant. We can cook it the same way like this, and we'll still cook it in a native style, even though it's not an indigenous product to the Western Hemisphere. So just like how the French do ratatouille, it has native ingredients, but it's not a native dish. So there's all these kind of different ways we can incorporate these um, ingredients, because out of all the arts, 
of, of the world, native food is the only one, and food really in, in, in general, globally, it really can have that appropriation argument 100% fully because I make a great asabuco. And if I want to sell that asabuco, there's no Italian chefs that can tell me you can't sell that or you can't make it. And, and we're, we all kind of have that agreement with it, you know? And the chefs travel the world. We learn how to cook. We're, uh, chefs are natural anthropologists. So, so they say, oh, I lived in Japan for five years and I make a great sushi. So, but when we come to this country, we tend to think, okay, well, just because some great sushi master in Japan taught you, it doesn't make you a great sushi maker because you're not Japanese. So it doesn't, for me, these type of arguments don't make any sense. So the, the, the way that I went from the book is we have to look at native food at a broader spectrum rather than just saying, if it's not native, it's, you know, we have to kind of look at it from a different perspective in, in that way. So if, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And, you know, we're, of course, talking about the book. It's being released this week. Um, and I know that you can pre-order it on, uh, on Amazon. I've seen that already. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, and Target. And Target. Yeah, I was going to ask, where yeah. else can you... Um, so, tar what did it say? The 17th, I think it's... Is 16th Tuesday. is being released? And um, Tuesday. Is that Tuesday? And um, so Target, Amazon, anywhere else? Barnes & Noble. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of independent bookstores. Um, they're... they're they're the first ones who kind of uh, brought the book in. And I, I know it took a few um, convincing and a few mobsters to get it into <laughs> Barnes and & Noble and, and, and Target. But it's, it's, it's actually, a, it's, it's published by Abrams, which is one of the top five publishers in New York. So it's, it's kind of from the big boys in New York. So it's, it's, gonna, it's, it's a good book. It's, it has a lot of value to it. And it's also pretty. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, I had the opportunity to take a look at it for the very first time this evening, and it's absolutely stunning. <clears throat> the photography is beautiful. Um, I just like the design concepts in here, too. I don't know. You can see that there, but you're really getting a masterful piece of uh, literature here um, that focuses on cuisine. You know, I was really interested in hearing your perspective, Freddie, about um, native food and, <clears throat> and what that really means. And, and who gets to cook what and how and why. Um, you know, in all actuality, it's all sacred. It all comes from Mother Earth anyway. Yeah. So, you know, um, and I think Freddie is the perfect example of how us as Diné people are ever evolving and ever changing to our environment and the world that we live in. And this is this book and what he's sharing with us this evening is the perfect example of that. So I'm looking forward to having this meal. I can see the steam coming off of it. I wish you all could smell over the internet. One of these days, that might be a possibility. And this is how the lamb should look when it comes out, OK? Oh, so I did a job in Phoenix last Friday. And it was for 30 people. And I did it in two hours. I don't know how I did this, but. <laughs> Do you have a serving spoon or something? Uh, yeah. I think he's put so many of them away, but you want like a... There's something I can scoop this stuff out. Like this one. Yeah, like that's fine. So there's really nothing in the book that you can't do if, if, you're, a, if you're an amateur cook. Everything is um, very approachable and accessible. And this is the um, braised uh, root vegetable dish that's um, it's also in the book. So you have uh, fennel, turnips. And again, you know, I always have to repeat that. I, I know for a fact that um, some are not indigenous ingredients, but this is stuff my grandmother would pick up, and this is how she would, and my mom, they would pick up and cook at home. So, and, you know, we were never taught this is an Italian dish or this is a French dish or any, anything. It's just always... This is food, you better eat it. <laughs> if your grandmother tells you that, you better, yeah. you better do it. <clears throat> so if you're interested, this next summer, Freddie's going to join us, and he's going to teach a two-day workshop here at Idlewild. It'll be June 18th and 19th, and um, look online. We'll have full workshop descriptions coming out at the end of this month.
um, and you can register uh, beginning February 1st of 2022. So we'll be sending out information online through our social media and we hope to see you this summer um, joining us. And then, you know, you can also uh, <clears throat> take part in Festival Week, Native American Arts Festival Week, and Freddie will be there the entire week uh, providing, you know, food ta ta tasters um, yeah, throughout the week. Taste testers is what I was trying to say. Taste testers. Okay, so here's a moment of truth. Okay. Okay. Now I like my meats um, rare to medium rare. But so the, one of the interesting thing is about native cuisine is uh, most older native people will not eat anything unless it's well. And I ask a lot of people and they, their response to me was interesting is a lot of them, the most common one was that it's still it's not fully cooked, which means it's not fully processed to be eaten. And I just always find that really interesting. So when I, when I cook for like my mother and she wants something cooked well, I'll get a, like a lower fattier grade steak so that she'll enjoy it a little bit more than, than a, like a filet mignon where there's no fat in it. And it's, it's, it tastes better when it's either rare or um, medium rare. So just, just keep that in mind as well if, if you have Native American guests at your house. My mom is the same way. We make fun of her. She eats her steak burnt. <laughs> like, how do you want it charred? <laughs> and so when, like, when we go out to eat with my mom, I always tell the server, she's going to want her steak well done, so can you put it on now so by the time the art order is ready, everything comes out. <laughs> so. Beautiful. It's Gorgeous. art. So we're going to put this on the platter here. And you know, again, like, like I said, it, it cuts your cooking time down a lot if you muscle the, the lamb out instead of um, roasting the whole thing. And there's nothing wrong with roasting the whole thing. It's just um, a lot of times I don't have a lot of time to cook in that capacity. So. So how long does it take both times if you were to cook it whole as opposed to this way? Whole would probably be about a good um, almost two hours, maybe even two and a half hours. And then, um, like this would be a good uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Wow. Are there any other questions from our audience? We're just asking this because we're going to turn you off really fast and go eat <laughs> just food. It <laughs> smells amazing in here. But no, you can unmute. Is, does anybody have any questions? Uh, Christy, John, pa Pauline, how, how are you guys doing over there? You're cooking. And maybe somebody else with us is cooking as well. <laughs> Beautiful. Any, any questions from anyone? I'd like to hear a little bit more about the sumac um, rub. Uh, we put it on ye uh, yesterday, John, oh, or morning. this morning to give time for it to... to uh, but is that something that, that is helpful to put on early, or does it not really matter? From what I understand, it really doesn't matter. Um, the thing that matters is if, you've, if you do have a rub that has a, a, an acid ingredient, since um, sumac is acidic, I would probably hold off on it for about 30 min an hour to 30 minutes before you put it in the oven. Because, oh, yeah, because okay. what acid does is it starts to cook the, the protein while it's right. in the um, while it's in the fridge, so it's just going to make it tough. But am I right that um, sumac it has a lot of historically medicinal attributes? And if you all already discussed this, you don't have to repeat yourselves. I just couldn't hear all of the discussion. Uh, pretty much every everything. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the medicinal purposes of sumac are, um, right off the top of my top of my head. But I do know that most likely anything that is indigenous picked by the elders, there's something medicinal about it. <laughs> right, 
Right. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now you're welcome. Yeah, if you go to flea markets on the Navajo Nation, you can find sumac and you can make tea with, with it, like Freddie said. Um, it helps a lot with a uh, sour stomach or if you have like a, yeah, or, or, or if you have something like, like food poisoning, um, it's going to kind of nix out whatever is swimming around in your, your tummy. So um, it okay. helps, it helps yeah, for things I like that. You say that and I remember someone telling me it, it, it had to do with digestion. Right. Oh my God. Does it come as a bush or a flower, you know, sort of a flower? It's more like a bush, but there, uh, sumac, too, was actually one of the materials used in traditional Navajo basket making um, and has a very specific smell to it. So if you were to smell... It's dying as well, right? Right, right. And if you smell like a, a, a Navajo basket, you can smell that sumac. So, like, that's why I like when people cook with it. It's like, I don't know, it's just like the whole essence of the yes. plant is everywhere in our culture, which is really kind of cool. I saw another, yeah, go ahead. I saw another question. Oh, I was just gonna ask a question. Thank you so much, Chef, for taking the time to prepare this meal. I wanted to ask, is this your favorite meal or is there something else that you really love, like your comfort food? Uh, my comfort food is actually in the book. It's the stewed, uh, stewed um, chicken with tomatoes. Oh. Uh, what, again, uh, 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 insight about the native cooking and the na um, na um, non-native cooking is my grandmother and my mother used to make um, basically a chicken cacciatore without the bell peppers and they'd use tomatoes. So when I figured out um, what, I, what chicken cacciatore was, I was like, this is the exact same thing my grandmother and my mom made, but they didn't use bell peppers, they used tomatoes. So it's, uh, it, you know, there's always a variant of every single dish uh, globally throughout different cultures. And um, again, the European food culture has kind of like the Right now, the flag posted on, in the land saying, you know, they can name everything a certain name, and uh, if it's diverted from that, it's not particularly what the culture who claims it, it to be. So, you know, we, we kind of got to break that mentality away from, from certain dishes, especially a lot of the native stews and soups. That was... Just one more question. Is, there, is spice and heat a part of your culture in terms of, like, flavoring? I'm not only asking because I'm Jamaican, so we use a lot of like very hot peppers, and I was wondering if that's part of the, you know, the cuisine. The one native culture that uses a lot of uh, spice would be the Pueblo, the Pueblo cultures. They span from northern New Mexico to um, the western part of Texas, and they're um, they live along the Rio Grande, and they harvest a lot of the peppers, the chili peppers, and also down in uh, northern. Uh, modern day Mexico, which, you know, we have to understand that there's a lot of indigenous people that live in Mexico as well who did a lot of pepper cultivation as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, and tribes like Pueblo people, they're sedentary, so they have the time. They stay in one place all year round and they're able to plant various different types of spices. Um, whereas Navajo traditionally, traditionally a long time ago, we moved around a lot. Um, we had summer and winter homes. Um, and so, uh, to sit and to, to, to cultivate spices like a, a Pueblo person would know, but we did trade a lot with them. So that's not to say that we didn't encounter those types of spices um, along the way. And a few more questions before we wrap up. Any more? Rosie, you're there. I think I see something in the chat, but I... That's a, that's a question from uh, Chris's mom asking if he's going to make all of this for her. <laughs> <laughs> when he comes. Hi, Mom. <laughs> and I saw who was it? Betty says she's just pre-ordered the book. Yes. Yeah. I am, too. I can't wait to get it. It's gorgeous. Um, it's hard copy, and it's just gorgeous. I can just see it sitting on my shelf here, which they don't just sit there. I, I love to, to try these recipes, and it's really just beautifully, beautifully done. Chef Freddie, did you want to tell us a little bit more about your upcoming spice line? Uh, there's going to be three. Um, it's coming out of a company from San Francisco, and there's a sumac blend, there's a New Mexico chili blend, and then there's also a Colorado Plateau blend, which is um, juniper, uh, rosemary, and cedarberry. Mm, so. I, th I think I saw Michael Slocum. You had your hand up, Michael? Well, I wanted to ask Chef Freddie what is a traditional or his favorite beverage with a meal like this? or with yeah. any, many of the uh, recipes in this book? Uh, there, there's a, one that I really like. It's, um, it's, we call it Navajo tea, mm -hmm. but when you search for it, you can find it um, under Mormon tea. 
as well as the name. Um, and it, it grows abundantly, like when you, even when you drive on the reservation at certain, like in um, early, early summer, you, there'll just be a, an abundance aside the road and you'll just see people picking them, um, just gathering them around. And, what, yeah. and it's, what is growing on the side of the road? What is it? The, the tea, the tea. Okay. Yeah. It's not necessarily tea in, in any sense. Um, it's more of a, um, a twig because they don't, har they don't uh, harvest it and make it like little tea bags. So, but right. they, we just call it tea because it's, it's a, the way to prepare it is by steeping it. And then you, you throw it in a pot with hot water yeah. and then strain it out. Huh? Yeah. Yep. And it's called what tea besides Mormon tea? Uh, Navajo, Navajo tea. tea. Navajo tea. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's so good. <laughs> I should have brought some. Thank well, you, Chef Freddie. I actually have a question about spices. If you can name the five spices that you won't live without, what are they? Um, I would probably also add herb into that as well. I definitely need my, need my bay leaf. Chris and I had a discussion about that earlier. Um, and now time, t dry time, because um, I don't know what's been happening lately, because again, I was down in the valley yesterday. I could not find any fresh thyme. And I stopped and I found this one, I think at the Target, you know, like it was just like, they're just at the weirdest places. They're not usually at the standard places where I usually shop. So dry time is always good to have, because um, I put that in a lot of my, um, um, when I cook um, the onions and things, the aromatics. Um, chili powder, New Mexican chili powder, that's always an important one because um, it, it's, 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 you're always going to have it. Even though it's great to have the fresh or the, dry, the dried variety, you know, the powder sometimes always come in handy. And it's also because of pure laziness. It's, you know, I just don't want to go to the market just to get something and if it's there. In the, because I think one un misunderstood thing about dried spices and dried um, herbs is the fact that it kind of devalues the product. And it, it's some, something where back in the early t 2000s when the Food Network came out, it's like everybody just wanted the fresh stuff, you know? And there's a whole reason why um, uh, we dry things and we preserve them. And it's always important to understand that, you know, it may be, this may be tied to it, but when we look at indigenous culture, we were the ones who always dry things, processed them, and we kept them for a long time. So do we get away from what, you know, cultures did for thousands of years, and do we just get the fresh things? So it, it kind, of, kind of adds this superiority value to ingredients in different foods. So I always think, you know, if, if you can keep it dried, keep it dried, because that's the way that um, they're supposed to be preserved. And they won't go bad in your um, cabinet as well. And the other two would probably be uh, cinnamon and nutmeg. I'm glad you talked a little bit about uh, dried and fresh herbs too, because mm -hmm. I was wondering about that as well. Yeah. There was a question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have a question. Is dried more potent than the. Yes, yes, dried. So if you're going to use the dried ingredients, I would always cut this amount in half, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. So if it says a, tables, a tablespoon of fresh basil, I'd cut it down from two tables two tablespoons less of the dried. So I got an arrow garden. <laughs> Do you know what that is? It's I... like this machine that grows fresh herbs, but I'm loving it. And when you talk about fresh versus dried, how do you dry it if you have fresh? Um, you just pretty much let it sit out and, and dry. But on any particular thing, because it can mold, it, it could be wet. Yeah, what, what, the, the best thing that you could do is just put your oven on, turn your oven on and turn it off, and then just break, break everything off, the leaves and everything, and just put it in the oven, and let the oven dry it for, um, I, like with choya buds, we do that, we put them in the oven for like about um, four hours, and then they'll put them out in the sun. Fantastic. Yeah. That's, um, because I've tried to like just, leave them and that doesn't work yeah so yeah. <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. well i don't know if we can uh we love you but we're going to get rid of you and eat chef's food but um i let's see where can we have this so you can see it so this was the one of the side dishes just, can we yeah. here, let's come under there this is the uh corn and squash oh nice beautiful this is the braised root vegetables
And this is the lamb and onion sauce. And now are you... Everybody is coming up. <laughs> are you going to assemble okay. the rice pudding? I'm going to get the rice pudding. Okay, now it's time for the rice pudding. Yeah, okay, there's the um, there's the rice pudding with cranberry. You see the right? Oh my gosh! Oh, nice. This is great, and we have in the background. You you can't see him. Chris Stroud is here. He's our chef from the dining hall here at Ida Wild Arts, and uh, and he he stopped the uh, the fire uh, alarm, the smoke alarm, going. So we're we're glad to have him here. He said, Freddie's coming. I better get over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chef Freddie, I want to thank you so thank you very me. much for this. This, this, this is a, a new high. It's a new bar for Idlewild Arts and the President's House and doing this. You know, a lot of things weren't good in the pandemic, but finding our way through Zoom and connecting with one another is definitely something great that's come out of it. So I want to thank you so much for coming and spending this time with us. And I want to thank Shalia Ben, our new director of the Native American Arts Program here at Idlewild Arts. I think the conversation was just fascinating. Uh, Shalia also, um, I think, I don't know when it is, but I don't know when anything is, but, um, <laughs> but she often has a series of um, artists, uh, uh, featuring artists, Native artists who talk about their work. Say, say just something about that. Yeah, we're going to kick off a storytelling series. So the winter months are, are, are traditionally the periods of time where we share stories among one another. So this is after uh, <clears throat> harvesting season is over. Um, it's cold. You're inside your home. You're eating your dehydrated foods. Um, you know, so we're going to kick off a series in late December um, about storytelling. And Ernie Siva, who is... Um, world renowned as a Kauia knowledge bearer, but also a very well-known storyteller is gonna kick off that series. And we're gonna just travel Indian country and listen to uh, amazing stories and how they touch, um, a home, touch close to our home and heart. Thank you for that. I'm looking forward to that. This is the second season that, that uh, Shalil will be doing that. It's really great. We hope you can join them. Of course, I don't know when anything is, but our website does. <laughs> so if you visit our website, you see a lot of those dates. Uh, once again, this is One World, One Idle Wild, the series. This will be in our second season. Uh, the podcast series is doing very well. In the second season, in, a diff in addition to Chef Freddy, uh, I have interviewed um, Michael uh, Kaiser, who is the president emeritus of the Kennedy Center. Uh, I'm interviewing uh, Lauren Buckman, who is uh, the president of Art Center College of Design here in Pasadena, California, and he is releasing a book, made to know and so we're going to be talking about his book and i've also interviewed uh that, that will be featured an interview with john diversa a three-time grammy winner uh and someone who has uh, come to idlewild i think for four years and is a part of our jazz in the pines so it's going to be a great season and then also stay tuned i can't tell you much about this because it's all top secret so i know you won't tell anybody but soon i will be talking about the new strategic plan a st strategic impact plan that our board recently adopted and we'll be talking about the vision for Idaho Arts to be the most dynamic arts community in the nation. I think we see ourselves clearly on that path. So stay tuned, you're gonna learn a lot of things, a lot of exciting things that are happening here at Idaho Arts. And from my home to yours, thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you, have a good evening. You've been listening to One World, One Idlewild, the series, presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. We at Idlewild Arts have always believed that art is the greatest teacher of humanity. We continue to believe that the practice of creativity hones a person's desire and ability to affect global change. My name is Pamela Jordan. To learn more about the Academy and its world-renowned summer program, please visit idlewildarts.org. 
To subscribe to the One World, One Idlewild podcast, please visit idlewildarts.org forward slash the series. At Idlewild Arts, we believe that art is the greatest teacher of humanity and that the practice of creativity hones each individual's desire and ability to craft global change. Please consider supporting the students of Idlewild Arts and visit idlewildarts.org forward slash giving to make a gift today. Thank you for listening to One World, One Idlewild, the series, a creation and production of Idlewild Arts Foundation, executive produced by Pamela Jordan, directed and produced by Rose Colella, edited, engineered, and mastered by Justin Holmes, marketing and publicity by Dana Albright, Molly Maple, and Alice Metcalf, marketing assistance by Rose Colella, Production and research assistance by Keith Miller. Creative consultation by Palencia Turner. Technical support by John Lawrence, Michael Quick, and Tom Wadbrook. Our theme song is Beaconing. It was composed and performed by the incomparable Marshall Hawkins. Pamela Jordan was appointed president of Idlewild Arts Foundation in 2014. Prior to this position, She held the distinction of being the first female and first African-American head of school of the Chicago Academy for the Arts, a position she held for 12 years. She currently serves on the boards of the California Association of Independent Schools, the Association of Boarding Schools, and Arts Schools Network. Pamela is also a member of the Global Education Advisory Council for Shanghai Hauer Collegiate School, Kunshan. One World, One Idlewild, the series, is a production of Idlewild Arts Foundation. Any use of materials, including reproduction, modification, distribution, or republication, without the prior written consent of Idlewild Arts Foundation, is strictly prohibited.